You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to see whether or not we're being too negative. If this section of the fan base that is like, I'm so sick of watching this, just hovering at 500 stuff. Or maybe we should just be super excited. I mean, Aloya Menez killing the ball all of a sudden, right? Lance Lynn, really exciting start. Like, finally looked solid on Saturday yeah, night. Yeah, looked like that himself. Was, that he? was awesome. There were, there were a lot of things to feel really good about, right? But I wanted to compare this time right here. Just before the trade deadline, July 31st is coming up. The Sox are sitting at 500. They're three games out of the postseason, four out of the AL Central League. And they're at 500. And I want to go back in time. And I want to talk about uh, another time that the exact same thing happened. Where the White Sox on July the 31st sat at 500. Sat three games out of the postseason. And you know what they did? You know what their owner said? There's no way we're catching Cleveland. And we had the infamous white flag trade in 1997. Yeah. And the reason I want to draw the parallel to this, this team and what they've been over the last couple of months is very similar to the team in 97 in which the front office said, we're just wasting our time here and we're not going to go out and be buyers. We're actually going to be sellers. Now, I don't think they're going to do that. Rakan's talking about adding a bullpen piece like we didn't get enough in the offseason. But we need another one. It's almost ridiculous. We're we're always looking for bullpen arms, second baseman, and right fielders. How many throw pillows can you put on the couch before the couch just really... You just got to admit the couch sucks. For those that were not around during the white flag trade, or don't know what we're talking about, you and I were, were young men, 20 years old, University of Illinois, remember that? We had just probably met each ah, other yes. like a year earlier. It's 1997. The world was a very, very different place. And uh, we were we were having a good time watching the White Sox play a very mediocre season. And the Sox had been to the postseason early around in the decade. Like, 93, won a division. 94, I thought they would have won the World Series if it wouldn't have been for the strike. 95, they start late. They end up firing their manager early on in the season. And you got Terry Boom Boom Bevington, one of the worst managers in the history of White Sox managers, managing the team in 1997. If you find Tony La Russa's decisions infuriating, thank your lucky stars if you didn't see Terry Boom Boom Bevington in action. I mean, he <laughs> makes Tony look like prime Tony. Oh, man. Like, I mean, that that was a bad, bad manager. Yeah, he, 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 he had no idea what was going on in any given game. The Sox make a trade on the 31st of July where they deal two of their starting five pitchers. Wilson Alvarez and Danny Darwin, and they trade Roberto Hernandez, a right-handed relief pitcher who was our closer, an established closer, a high-end closer, a veteran closer. Yeah, actually, a, a very good closer for a long time, actually. This would be akin to say, we're going to trade Lucas Giolito. You got you got Danny Darwin, was ah, he's like a fifth starter. Okay, Roberto Hernandez was your Liam Hendricks. OK, he, he may not have been exactly Liam Hendricks, but that, that would be what the role is. And they went out and they picked up six players, bullpen guys, guys that might end up in the rotation. Uh, Mike Caruso. Remember him? He was going to be a great shortstop, but he, he Mike he Caruso. Had yeah, he was the heir apparent to Ozzie Guillen. But they go out and they make this trade. And Jerry Reinsdorf has a quote in which he says, anyone who thinks we can catch Cleveland is crazy when this trade goes down. There was backlash. There wasn't like Twitter and podcast backlash because it didn't exist, right? But there was backlash. Like sports radio was filled with White Sox fans screaming and yelling. They they saw an actual decrease in ticket sales. People were like, this is ridiculous. We're only, and here we go, this is where they were on that day. Three games out of the American League Central Division sitting at 500 in third place. They're a half game behind Milwaukee, who's in their division at the time, And they're three back from Cleveland. Doesn't that sound eerily similar to where we are now? Like, (laughs) 
right on similar, not even eerily similar, like almost a dead nuts on where where we are sitting today. Right. And now let's talk about what the team had before somebody says, well, I mean, do they have the talent this team has? And as I get into this, do not forget about our proud sponsors, Family Waterproofing Solutions. They're going to keep water out of the basement. They're going to fix your foundation issues. They're going to protect you. They've been doing it since 2013. Give them a call 24-7-708-330-4466. Mention Socks in the Basement. You get a deep discount. See what a difference a family makes at FamilyDry.com. But that 97 White Sox team, they had Frank Thomas, future Hall of Famer, uh, first baseman. Uh, his OPS that season for the season was over 1,000 at 1067. He was killing the ball. He had 347 that year and slugged 611. He hit 35 home runs with an OPS plus of 181. They had Albert Bell in left field with an OPS of 823 for the season. He went out and hit 30 bombs. They they also had Harold Baines have that like last great season. He only plays in 93 games. He hits 305 with an 857 OPS. He had a 127 OPS plus that season. You got Rob Ventura over at third base. Now, if I'm not mistaken, he gets injured at some point during that season. Is that, where he, is that when he breaks his leg? Because it looks like he only plays in that 54 might have been, games. That might have been the ankle injury. The yeah, ankle there injury. Was a, for those who don't remember, there was a really nasty ankle injury that Ventura suffered where... It was grotesque. Frankly, it's one of those where I, I sit there and I say, Google it, but don't watch the video. Yeah, it was grotesque. They would warn people before they showed it on TV. It was awful. Uh, Maglio Ordonez, first season, he comes up at one point here. He plays in 21 games, hits 319 with a 918 OPS in those in those 21 games. Man, they should have brought him up sooner. Where's the talent evaluation on that one? You needed a player. You were in a pennant well, chase. Uh, remember, remember, this is Boom Boom Bevington that's in charge. And other than the fact that the marketing that year was like they were in a comic book. I don't know if you remember the, the, the commercials, but they were in a comic book. And you had things like Ozzie Guillen had a, uh, you know, this, this, like vacuum for an arm instead of a glove. And Terry Bevington's brain was like four times its regular size and like throbbing veins were showing. It turns out that might have just been the result of like a massive accident or something. (laughs) But I don't I don't think that I don't think that Bevington was willing to play a guy like Mags until he absolutely had to. Yeah. And then you also had the in and this will sound familiar, the established veteran starting pitcher added to the staff that you expect to be an anchor in your staff who goes 9-14 and with a 5.79 earned run average and a whip of 1.622. I'm talking about Jamie Navarro. Oh, that's right. That was Jamie. That was was the one time Jerry opened up the wallet for a guy. Right. And so now here's here's the thing. There's so many similarities, not only record-wise, how far back you are at this point, the way the team played that year, that you had some stars that were injured, you had other guys that were playing at a, at a high enough level that you could have believed that if you added a piece or two, you would get into the postseason and have a puncher's chance. And you also have to remember, this is at a time when the White Sox had not won a World Series since before Prohibition. So, I mean, like, it had been a long time. You were even more desperate to make it to the postseason, right? Right. And so they go out and they make this trade and they wave the white flag on July the 31st of 1997. And what we're approaching here with this trade deadline, right now here in 2022, there's an awful lot of like parallels you can draw with that team. A team in which Jerry Reinsdorf laughed when people said, you know, why'd you trade away all these guys to the Giants? And he's like, well, we were never going to catch Cleveland. Cleveland's basically just, in in 1997, just as far out as the Twins are right now. You're just as far back from the postseason. In fact, you're not only just as far back, there are more teams that you're in the fight for that last wildcard spot because there were not that many spots to get into the postseason back in 1997. So it might actually be harder to make it into the postseason here in 2022, where you're at right now and how you've been playing, than it would have been for that 1997 White Sox team. All right, Sox in the Basement listeners, if you or a loved one have trouble getting around the house, bathroom needs to be refitted, you need a ramp that goes up to the door, you need one of those lifts to bring you from the first to the second floor, or you just need some medical equipment for diabetes care or sleep apnea, you need some oxygen tanks around the house, Hyatt 
Home medical equipment located on the south side. Big, beautiful showroom. They have everything. The specialized chairs and the beds. You name it, they have it for you. It's all about keeping you or your loved one independent and in the home. And they'll work with your insurance company as well. Make sure you get as much bang for your buck as possible. Plus, if you mention Saks in the Basement, you get money off as well. Get the Saks in the Basement discount. See the already incredible low pricing. Stop in and see them today, 3518 West 95th Street and Evergreen Park, or visit them online and learn more at hhme.com. This is what ran through my head this weekend. It was nagging me. I was sitting there thinking to myself, I've seen this before. I've seen this before. I've seen this kind of season before. And I was just, it was nagging me. And then all of a sudden I was like, you know what? I'm going to look up 97. I'm going to look up the white flag trade. Where were we? And man, when you put the standings and you look at the rosters, it, you could almost start erasing one guy's name and putting another guy's name in pitching slots. You could almost start erasing who, you know, who your middle of your order was and putting the other ones. And it's almost like the same. It's almost like the same team. Now, back in 1997, I was furious over the white flag trade. So I'm not telling you that this is what the White Sox should do. Not saying that. If anything, it reminds me of the fact that I thought we still had a chance. Even though that season had been terrible, I was convinced that 97 team could still catch the Indians. So looking at it, not only did I find these parallels, but it also reminded me that 20-year-old Chris in 1997 actually thought we had a chance. That far back, having the leapfrog one team that was in between us in first place and then catch the first place team in our division and get by them, sitting at 500 only on July the 31st, I still thought that we had a chance and they should never, they should have been buyers instead of sellers. So if anything, looking at it, on one hand, was a trip down memory lane and laughing about Terry Boom Boom Bevington and the terrible job that he did as manager, which was even more infuriating than than Tony La Russa. I look at that 97 team. I remember my feeling when they made that trade. And I now, for all the things that have driven me nuts about this team, cannot pull myself away from the 2022 White Sox. Because if I believed in the 97 team, I got to believe in the 2022 team. With all the mistakes, the terrible mismanagement, the way that they didn't handle their offseason properly, the guy who's the manager, who I don't know what he's doing sometimes, the overresting of players, all that stuff. Every single thing that infuriates me about this team, if I believed in 97, I believe in I have to believe in 2022. I have to think that the addition of Jimenez back into the lineup, the the spark from Lance Lynn that's out there, the you know, the fact that I believe that Luis Robert will be back. I felt I felt it was positive what Rick Hahn said. The fact that he's already working out, I believe that it's going to come together. And this team is in a even maybe slightly better spot than 1997. So because of that, it almost reinforced. It made me kind of say, okay, take a breath. You might be frustrated with this season, but I'm I'm still in. I'm still in because I think this team can get into the postseason. And if they if they figure out what they were lacking in the first half and Tony doesn't get in the way, they can do something. Well, you're gonna compare and contrast to the ninety seven team. One of the things you gotta look at is, you know, the pitching on this team is better. So they traded Wilson Alvarez and Danny Darwin, who were probably their two best starters that year. And Alvarez, of course, had been, you know, a guy that the, that the team had come to rely upon as part of the, you know, the, the rotations that carried him into the 93 playoffs. He was their best pitcher for the season. If you look statistically, he was the best pitcher they had in that entire group, Wilson Alvarez. Doug Drabick was on the team. That's another signing that they went out and got and doing a mediocre job. Because Drabeck was at the end of his career. He was... 34 that year, but a 574 ERA for Doug Drabeck. James Baldwin was in one of his first seasons. Or uh, yeah, he was early on in his career. Made 32 starts, a 5.27 ERA. Jamie Navarro, we mentioned, was a disaster of a signing, a 5.79 ERA. So Alvarez, their best pitcher for a while, that at that point, uh, had a 3.03 ERA. Danny Darwin, a 41 year old veteran, who th- there was a weird thing that was going on with the 90s White Sox where they would get a dead cat bounce off of a bunch of free agents. You had like Ellis Burks came back after not being able to swing a bat for three years and then right. had a good season with him. So Darwin was having this this sort of end of career, I got one last one in me run. And so they traded those two guys and left you with a rotation that was basically in shambles. But our rotation in 2022, the White Sox rotation in 2022, Dylan Cease, Michael Kopech, assuming he remains healthy, 
Johnny Cueto, I mean, those are three really good pitchers right now. And if Lance Lynn is more of the Lance Lynn of his last start because he's gotten back into his rhythm and he's found it and he's got comfort level with his knee and his mechanics, this team is in much better shape to go forward. The only guy that's left kind of out of that that conversation is Lucas Giolito, who continues to be somewhat of a mystery. The bullpen's a little bit better. It's just that I think for the Sox this year, you're looking at a lineup that's really struggled compared to the lineup that they had in 97. They, they trade their two best pitchers in 97 on a team that could absolutely rake. And this year they've got better pitching than they did in 97, but the team is struggling to find offense. Well, I would submit if you believe in that 97 team and that they should have added at the deadline, then it's absolutely valid to believe in the 2022 team sitting in the exact same position. In spite of the fact that maybe this version of Cleveland is better than the 97 version or this version of Minnesota is better than, you know, it, it, you can you can make those arguments too, but I think it's easier to add offense at a deadline deal than it ever is to add impact pitching because it's so hard to get impact pitching because nobody wants to give it up for cheap. But there's going to be a bat out there, right, that you could get that the, the Sox could probably afford to give something up for. And I'm not saying Soto because we, we know that the White Sox would have to gut the young core of this team in order to get the guy. And I'm not saying I'm even against that, but there's going to be guys that are out there that are going to be sold off that can come in and can supplement what they have that they can do that. But more to the point too, it would really help back to your, you know, to talking about how this team sometimes is constructed and the lineup is constructed. It would really help if you didn't have somebody like Andrew Vaughn sitting in a lot of games where he could be playing, you know, and should be playing every day or playing these matchup games where, you know, and I know Larry hit another home run the other day, but for the love, I mean, you know, you, you don't have any consistency up and down the lineup. And maybe it is something as simple as just saying, we're going to find a middle infielder that we think can, can carry us the rest of the way and forget Harrison and, and Larry, or we're going to find a different outfielder to go along with Robert and Jimenez even though I think that guy's sitting there in Andrew Vaughn or, you know, whatever it is, I think they can, I think they can make a trade and I think they could be a buyer on the cheap and still give the sucker a ride. Look, they have to use the pieces they have properly. And I, I am concerned about the absurd amount of rest that we're giving players. Like it worked out on Sunday. You didn't need Andrew Vaughn after all Dylan Cease was dealing and, you know, guys were hitting the ball. And so in the end it, it worked out, but I still stand by what, the Sox in the Basement Twitter account put out when the lineup was announced for Sunday, Andrew Vaughn was off on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. He played baseball on Friday and Saturday and had an off day scheduled for Monday and then the following Thursday a couple days after that because you you got Monday and Thursday off days this week. And you sat him to rest him on Sunday. He's 24 years old. And not injured as far as we know, right? Right. And I know it's a doubleheader on Saturday. I understand that. And I know that you won the game. But just because you won the game doesn't mean that it's the right thought process. Let's take the Cleveland Guardians. Let's take a team that every time I see the White Sox play them, it's all hands on deck. You don't see stars resting. You see their starters playing both games of doubleheaders. Terry Francona has the Guardians ready to play and puts more stock into the head-to-head games against the division contenders that he has to beat in the White Sox and the Twins. And I look at the amount of guys on their team that have played or appeared in more than 80 games this year. Owen Miller at first base, 84 games. Jimenez, their second baseman, 83. Ahmed Rosario, 88 games. Jose Ramirez, their star, 90 games. The annoying Stephen Kwan, 82 games. Miles Straw, 91 games in center field. When I look at the White Sox, and I know that there's injuries, but you know, guess what? The Guardians have had injuries as well, okay? Every team well, gets I was going to say, in there, you've got Josh Naylor, who's appeared in only 66 games because of injury. Right. But he's been a tormentor of the White Sox this year, and he shows up in every lineup. Meanwhile, 94 games for Jose Abreu, and the next closest player is below 80. A.J. Pollock at 77 games. Not even 77 starts, and he was hurt. Right. Anyway, he, he, yeah, he hasn't even started in every one of those games. He's coming late in games. Those aren't even complete starts. So here's the thing. Either the White Sox training staff 
is not good enough, not skilled enough, and not capable of keeping these players healthy enough to play in enough games that they can have an impact. So where your stars can be out on the field and can play. Or they're overly cautious. That's how I feel at this point. All right? I know somebody's going to say right away, are you calling them soft? Are you insulting them? Are you saying that these guys aren't tough? Is that what you're trying to say? Eh, Maybe. I don't know if it's the players, though, or if it's the training staff telling the players. You know, a player comes to you and goes, I don't know, I got a little twinge in my elbow, or I got a little thing in my leg, or whatever like that. You know, some trainers, Herm Schneider, there's always these stories about him, the, the, the guy who was in charge forever for the White Sox. Gian's told it on TV. He would tell him, rub some dirt on and get out there, you're fine. You give him a quick evaluation, go, ah, you got tightness. Everybody gets tightness. You're young, go play. And the Sox seem like snake bit after what happened last year with all the injuries. They are so cautious, okay? They're resting everybody. They might be resting them for a lot of holes of golf in October if they keep resting as much as they're, as they're resting them. I just feel like there's an overrest. I, I get that there's injuries. Injuries are part of the game. But when you got young guys, when you got, when you got, first of all, when you got Jose Abreu at 35 years old with 94 games that he's playing in, somebody's got to start asking why some of these 25-year-olds can't do that and why the training staff is telling them they can't do it. I mean, why, why is Josh Harrison capable of playing both games in a doubleheader? I've seen him do it multiple times. But some of these younger players that, that you would think heal quicker because of their age. I know what I was like in my mid-20s compared to my mid-30s. All right, if I went out and played softball in my mid-20s, went out and played softball in my mid-30s, I was a lot, I was a lot worse for wear in my mid-30s. I can imagine that if a guy like Josh Harrison can do it, I, I'm wondering why some of the other younger guys can't. You see these guys that get these extra days rest and everything, all these built-in days of rest. It's, it, it, it's clearly a team philosophy, but I also have to start wondering, is it the right philosophy? Because the Cleveland Guardians are in front of you, and they're not doing it. The official brewery of Socks in the Basement is Hailstorm Brewing Company, located in Tinley Park, 8060 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue. Highly acclaimed new brewer Will Turner is bringing decades of experience and excellence to Hailstorm Brewing, tweaking some of their classic styles and innovating new beers of his own. Every time I'm out there, it's always fun. They've got one of the top five beers in all of Chicagoland, in my opinion. Dominatrix. It's a triple IPA. It's got Citra and Centennial hops. It's 11%, and I'm telling you, it is so easy drinking, you have to be careful. But man, is it incredible. I'm looking at their online menu right now at hailstormbrewing.com. Looks like they've added a version with grapefruit in it. I think I have my weekend plan set. Big tap room, outdoor patio, complete with a fire pit for chilly evenings, live music on the weekends, trivia nights, all kinds of fun events. Follow them on Facebook at Hailstorm Brewing Co. Or once again, check out the entire lineup and get out there to Tinley Park, hailstormbrewing.com. What do you think? Are they overresting? Look at the guys who are playing a lot, okay? Vaughn is really the only everyday player that's that young. Sheets has been up and down. Robert's been injured in and out of the lineup. Mokata's been injured in and out of the lineup. Anderson's been injured in and out of the lineup. This is not a young team. I, I think I say this every other show, but this is not a young White Sox team. And we need to stop thinking of them as a young White Sox team. Their average age is right around 30 years old. So I wonder if it's something where they're getting caught up in rotations and guys who are young, like Vaughn, are either the casualty of a manager who just doesn't think he matches up against certain guys, which is utterly insane at this point. He is just resting him in rotation with everybody else and doesn't need to be, and he needs to start worrying about getting some of these younger guys in the lineup every day. Maybe it is something, maybe this is the the thing that changes in the second half, is that with Jimenez and with Robert, whenever he comes back, assuming he comes back just fine, that... You know, Jimenez, Roberts, and either Vaughn or Sheets are going to be in the outfield for the most part, or Pollock's going to be out there with one of those two guys DHing every single day. Anderson, if he's healthy, will be in the lineup every single day. Moncada, if he's healthy, will be in the lineup every single day. And then you can rest a guy like Harrison, who's 34, or you can give a Brayu a day off every now and again if he ever wants one, or Pollock a day off because they're the older guys. But again, we have this just because we came out of a rebuild, there's this this thought process that. This is a young team that that can play, 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 and go, go, go. And that, 
unfortunately, is the Cleveland Indians, who are on average 26 years old. The White Sox are on average 30, which means that they've got old guys and young guys, and there's just not much in between. They don't have a whole lot of guys that are sitting there in their prime right now. Yeah, it, it, it's infuriating because maybe that's what needs to be addressed at the at the, the deadline here, is maybe it, it has to be Rick Hahn trying to find one or two guys that are going to be with this team for a couple of years that are not necessarily a core member of the team, but they're young and they just go out and they play and they appear and they show up and they have a history of not getting hurt because what we have right now is we have a young, the young core of the team can't stay on the field for very long for some reason. And then the old hats have to make it up for it and they're no longer in their prime. So it's, it's, it's a weird dichotomy that the, the team has here. And, and I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if it's the training staff or I don't know if it's just the players are being coddled and they need to rub some dirt on it and go play. As we approach the trade deadline here, and Rick Hahn's talking about adding an arm because Aaron Bummer is going to be a while, and Garrett Crochet, of course, out for the year, and they want to get another left-handed arm in the bullpen. All right, And that's fine. all we need? <laughs> I hope that you know, and that's that's the that's the thing, and that's what I want to ask you here before we get uh, out of here. Yikes. Yeah. What do you what do you want or not want to see at the deadline? Because my biggest fear, and again, this falls back to all the White Sox teams that I've watched flounder around five hundred, and then I watched the white flag trade in ninety seven, and I've I've seen this before, right? We're only a five hundred baseball team. We have, you've shown me nothing that says you're more than a 500 baseball team to date. All right. Every time there's hope, it's taken away. Every time you're down, somehow they climb back in and they pull you back in. They go, no, nah, don't give up on this team just yet. We're back to 500. And it, it's been like that now. It's been a struggle. It's been, it's been a struggle for the team. It's been a struggle for us to watch. Uh, my biggest fear is giving up too much for a rental player when if it doesn't work out, that was a dumb trade. I, I think what I want to see them do is if they're going to add anything, add pieces that are going to be around for more than just this season. Because I think if you just throw prospects away in the hopes that you can fix this, when the team has not demonstrated that it could it can even get above 500 sustainably, like we can't get the two games over 500, right? If we get one game up, we're going to lose the next day. It's almost like a given. And it's been that way. I don't feel like this team is worth rental players. I wouldn't throw prospects for rental players and say, all we are is we just need this extra bat and this extra pitcher and it's full speed ahead to the playoffs. Because when you get to the playoffs, a a team that's playing under 500 against winning teams this year, and they did the same thing last year, is likely to get exposed and bounced out early in the postseason anyway. So why? Why go and do it if you don't have a chance? I, I think if they're going to add... I'd love to see him get in the postseason. I'd love to have that puncher's chance. But don't give away a lot here unless you're getting something back that's going to be part of the team beyond 2022. That's what I would like to see. That's how I want to see the trade deadline approach by the White Sox. I don't want to see prospects for rental players because I don't think there's enough rental players out there that instantly take this team and make them a favorite to win the AL pennant. No, what I would honestly like to see, this is going to sound weird, but I'd like to treat them as sellers in the sense that you take a guy that's got value like AJ Pollock, who is going to be somebody that uh, a veteran that a team like say the Padres might want, or the Giants might want down the stretch. I would almost like to see someone like him traded to see if you can bring back two young players who could come in and contribute now, right? Two guys who are on the verge who might not be stars, but can be solid role players like a left-handed reliever who might not be on the level of Garrett Crochet, might not be what they think Aaron Bummer is, but can be a very solid addition to the bullpen, kind of like Tanner Banks has been, okay? And then maybe that's where another young player, somebody else who is not necessarily going to be the next star, but is going to be a guy that's going to be a glue guy, that's going to be a guy that just shows up, does his job, and you don't have any questions about him being there and is perfectly competent. Like, how how bad would that be if, say, you got a controllable second baseman who's competent at his job and is going to be here for the next couple of years? Oh, come on. We're not going to be able to find one of those. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. 
Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.